Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the new CEO of Box, and I've literally been in post since the 4th of October, so it's, it's very early, but I'm really delighted that you're all here, and I'm absolutely thrilled that we've got this incredible exhibition, Songlines, at the Box and here at the Arts Institute, and thank you to Mary and her team for making so much possible and for working in such close partnership with the Box over the last um, few years, and I hope that arrangement will continue into the future. I'm sure that many of you here have seen um, this amazing exhibition and as you know it's a collaboration with the National Museum Australia in Canberra and it's a really key important element of the UK Australia Festival which is taking place at the moment and this exhibition is can only be seen in Plymouth at the UK, in the UK, before it goes on to um, Berlin and Paris. So I'm delighted we've actually got two colleagues from Paris here today who will be taking the exhibition um, next year. So a big welcome to them. I'm absolutely delighted um, this evening to be able to introduce you to Margot Neal, the curator of Songlands. Well, I should say the lead curator, who has worked with um, many of the artists in the show to curate this fantastic exhibition to Beatrice Bijon and Martin Thomas from the Menzies Australia Institute. Um, I'll just say a few words about each of the speakers and then I'll literally hand over to them. Margot Neal is a distinguished, distinguished curator and writer. She is head of the Centre for Indigenous Knowledge, Senior Indigenous Curator and Principal Advisor to the Director at the National Museum of Australia. She is also an adjunct professor in the Australian National University's Centre for Indigenous History. Margot is co-recipient of seven Australian Research Council grants in collaboration with the Australian National University, Monash, Yale and the University of Victoria. She has published widely across disciplines including social history, art and culture in the Asia Pacific region and Aboriginal Australia. Um, her colleagues this evening are Beatrice Bijon and Martin Thomas. They are the co-directors of the Menzies Australia Institute at King's College London and they're currently based at the Menzies thanks to a partnership arrangement with their home university, the Australian National University in Canberra. Beatrice is a scholar of literature and a historian and curator of women's, women's suffrage campaigns. Martin Thomas is a historian of exploration, expeditions and cross-cultural contact, contact. Beatrice and Martin are both filmmakers and co-produced Etched in Bone, a 2018 documentary on the repatriation of stolen human remains to an Aboriginal community in Northern Australia. So without further ado, I now want to hand over to our very distinguished panel um, to lead the conversations. And there will hopefully be an opportunity for you um, to, to make comments later on. But I'm now going to hand over to our three speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, for your generous introduction. For 40 years, the uh, Menzies Australia Institute uh, has been the leading center for discussion and debate about issues Australian in the UK. And as um, uh, Victoria said, Martin and I are fortunate to be leading the Institute this year thanks to a partnership agreement with our home university, that is the, Austra the, the National Australian University in Canberra. We're additionally proud to be working with the box here and with the UK Australia season of culture in bringing you this Songline exhibition this evening. Martin and, and I feel, uh, feel like we've been following the Songline for a very long time now. Margot Neal is uh, a great friend and a colleague. We first heard about the show uh, a long time ago. At the time, it was just the inkling of an idea, and it was in her living room in Canberra. And wow, for those of you who've seen it, you know how it has mushroomed since then. We saw it several times when it was at the National Museum uh, of Australia in Canberra, 
Now it's at the beginning of a, a long walkabout that will take the show to um, Berlin first and then Paris. It's a pleasure to be reminded here in Plymouth of its rich, profound and often humorous uh, storytelling drawn from such deep and dynamic ancestral knowledge. We'd like to thank Margot and the National Museum of Australia for putting it on the road. And we also would like to thank Judith Robinson and all her amazing colleagues um, at the box for making this happen and for making us feel so welcome. So at the core of our conversation tonight is Margot Neal herself. She has prepared an extraordinary presentation that will take you through the exhibition and its backstory. That will be followed by some on-stage discussion uh, between Margot, Martin and me, and then we'll have some time for some questions. So without further ado, let's move to the main attraction. Over to you, Margot Neal, head curator of Songlines. Thank you very much, Beatrice. <laughs> <clears throat> well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and their thanks, Beatrice Martin, and of course, now a new colleague is Victoria Pomery from The Box. Um, and uh, we're just thrilled to contribute to The Box's launch into more than the UK. It's now obviously part of the world scene in a, in a very active and live way. Um, and of course, to the Institute for taking the, the end, the tail end, but not the end, of the song lines uh, in the other part of your building. So it's, it's, it is a very connective kind of thing, song lines. It's the connective tissue of many things. And as you can see here, it says sizzling in the intersection, digitising the dreaming. Well, this, I use sizzling because this is about Indigenous and not Western and Indigenous knowledges fusing together to create what I actually call a third archive, right? The Indigenous archives, the first of the Australian continent and the Western is the second. And when you mix them all up together, you end up with a third. And so it's sort of, it's working in that space between the two, which is a, the sizzle. And the digitising, the dreaming is really what the elders came up with to way to preserve the knowledge into the future is to join the youth in the digital domain. So it's digitising the dreaming. Come from north, down to south. Chocolate really, really big story. And so that the world can see in Australia that this is a chocolate for all the people. Come and see. Well, many of you would have seen that um, in the exhibition, and that's to actually make it very clear to everybody the actual stories and content of this, um, of song lines, belongs to my co curators. So instead of the old system where you'd have Indigenous people, you'd be your advisory group or your reference group, they are my co curators. They need me as much as I need them to do this show. So I'm the knowledge holder of how to choreograph, if you like, the information and it is their story. And these are the seven sisters. So this narrative, of course, has to have characters, and, and here they are, and this is in the Canberra rendition of it. And you can see, um, just so as you know what, what they are, you know they're related the, to the stars, Pleiades, the seven sisters, star cluster. And the older sister is the one whose job to care for the other sisters, to protect them from harm, from, in that case, the risk factor is the male to remind them of their responsibilities in marriage and kinship relations. And he is always lurking, always present. So all these stories clearly have um, um, carry critical knowledge in a non-text-based society. This is one of Australia's foundation stories, as ancient as the land itself. An Australian story that immerses us in our country. An epic tale of intrigue, desire, drama and passion. A wild chase through the heart of the land. These are the stories of my peoples to share with those who came after. Our country, our people, our story. Here comes... So all 
less familiar with you, Mob, because I'm sure you've all been over there. So the, seven, so the actual saga is essentially this. Every civilization has epic sagas to tell the creation of um, the creation myth and to transmit cultural values. Um, in this one, the Seven Sisters, it's an epic saga where a um, ancestral being or sorcerer takes human form and wrongfully pursues these sisters who in Aboriginal law he's not entitled to and, um, and, and in order to possess them, he lures them by shape-shifting into all sorts of things they need to survive. They're delectable foods, um, um, water, shade, and then all of their encounters over the continent, over millennia, creates the features of the land. So in those features of the land, are like those memory places, is where you learn knowledge. And as you grow older and age grading, you learn more and more. So that's basically the thing, the, the story that th threads it. And song lines are, encounters are, um, can be visualised as corridors or pathways of knowledge that crisscross the continent. Now, that piece there where you saw um, uh, the snake almost molesting the woman, which is actually part of the story when you think about it, because the snake, like in all lot of cultures is the maleness or the risk or the forbidden or the, you know, temptation. So, you know, these it's a universal story in many ways, but a case study is in Australia in this case. Um, and that's the transition zone out of the, the world you've come from into the desert. So that's sort of meant to unsettle you a bit. Um, and kids love the snake, as you may have noticed. And this is, this is the complete one that was done on a CAM, uh, a, I think it's a CAM or CAD program. And that's actual Google Earth, Google Maps of that actual part, part of one of the deserts. The rain comes, the flowers come, and that's it. So in this place, people get very excited. They do handstands or they faint on the floor in ecstasy. And it's somebody you know. <laughs> you don't usually see a flat out in the floor, spread eagle in the... It's not her style normally. And um, now this... How did this project start? It started because this fellow, David, not only because of him, there were a whole mob of Anangu. I mean, that's Aboriginal people from the desert, from this centre part. It's a generic name. They actually have specific names. Um, so he, he, we had a meeting in Canberra for years. They were worrying because they're ageing and the young people were, were too interested in all this new technologies, not going to learn the stories. And remember, it's an oral-based culture. So um, they came to Canberra, had a big meeting. And David Miller leant over the table in this meeting and really hushed but weighty tones said, our song line's all been broken up and we need you to help us put them back together. And that was really quite profound because if you remember, museums were the last places Aboriginal elders would go because of st stealing and remain, human remains and sacred objects and so on. But our museum was a new museum and I was Indigenous and there were other Indigenous people. So whatever they knew, they needed their technologies to assist them to save the song lines. So it, it was out of that clearly a collaboration, which they initiated. So the whole process had to be different from normal. And these, and that set us up on a very long journey. It took us five, six, seven years, over 7,000 kilometres at least, the desert, and we only touched part of it. And so we have to, you know, in this collaboration, you have to go to their desert, their place. And as you see in the map here, that's an Aboriginal visualisation of the song lines. We, we only actually got... I've got a pointer here if I know how to... Um, we actually, over this time, we only actually got to the centre and back again, this part. But those song lines actually existed not only across Australia, but in fact the whole world, because the um, Pleiades and Orion are visible from the northern and southern hemispheres. So these stories exist in Africa, Ireland, um, Japan, everywhere but of course they've been subsumed other layers of other peoplings. 
um, just to show you on the actual map of Australia, you can see the three deserts that we cover. And that's, you know, over 500,000 500, square kilometres. Now, this is, how, this is how Australia is seen by the elders. It's land stories. The whole continent is not earth, it's not surface, it's only stories. You know that all the places are named, all the locations are named, they're all embedded in songs and stories and performances. And, probably, and so you can see how the song lines have crisscross the whole continent. But if you also see, it's uh, in the image of a person. You've got the, um, oops, see, there he is. He gets in the way all the time. Um, you can see here, this is the navel, the pubic area, the lungs. And so all of it is seen as a personage. So your relationship with country is as a, a person. You cry for country. You worry for country. You worry when country gets sick. You try and heal it. You... So it's very much, so when bad things happen to country, as is happening, it's a lot of grief. So it's not only about lack of resourcing, but it's just, it's their job to keep their mother healthy. It's, I say to people, it's almost like, you know, the mother that nurtures you and then you, you know, it's like raping your mother. It's that, you know, awful. Or stealing from your mother or... And, of course, the history, the stories are written in the land. Now, this is Wadi Nuru, and he's the one you'll see throughout the exhibition who's in pursuit of the ladies wrongfully. And um, it's, it's, the painting you'll see in the show on the ground was done at the base of that. So you can see land features all across. I think I'll put another one in. You'll see in a minute of how you can see the story in the land. That's more apparent than most. But the other important thing is that it's a knowledge system that um, is written in the land, but it's written, embedded or embodied in the land that has relevance to the contents of the story and, and the country around it, whereas w the Western system is written in books, stuck in a, uh, a big box on the top of a piece of country. It has nothing to do with the stories that are in the box. So... An Inuit man once said to me, trouble with white fellas, they keep their brains in books. Keep all their brains in books. You know what happens? And so, um, um, whereas, as I said, the Aboriginal or Indigenous knowledge are embodied. They have to be, you know, physically and spiritually engaged with. And the other important thing, too, is that um, these paintings you see in there, we would say they're about country, but in fact they are country. So when these ladies here go to that painting, they have to touch it and they're connecting directly. You can see that painting was painted by their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunties in 1994. So when they're touching it, they're connecting with their mothers and their grandmothers and their aunties and the ancestral being whose country it is and who, with whom they have responsibility. So it's not... Um, so they... You know, they talk to it, they cry, they chant, they, you know, worry, they do all of the things as if you're being reconnected with a person. Conservatives haven't got a hope. <laughs> They're just not in the picture. <laughs> um, so, sorry, conservatives in the room. Um, so, and therefore this project had to take on a governance model. It wasn't your normal model. So as you can see, at the centre of this one is what we call, it's not the director of the institution, it's the jukupa. Jukupa is the law. It's the law. It's also used as words, dreamings and things, the law. So it's the law that's at the centre because the law is what tells you where you can go, when you can go, who you can go with, whether your gender is the right gender for knowing that stuff. So it is, in fact, the controller of the project in that way and then you can see how we so we we went we explored what to save the song lines by preserving the song lines rather record them archaeologically visually performatively um ecologically because that's the way aboriginal people know country 
you know, I've called it four dimensional, but it's all dimensions. And knowledge is not compartmentalised into those categories I just said, whilst to record it, it clearly looks so, but they're not. Any one painting, which we'll see shortly, will show you that um, everything, every field of knowledge is in every single act or painting. So clearly, as I said earlier, I'm not the curator. I can only, you know, I'm... Got, I manage the choreography almost, you know, and they are, it's their content, their stories, so we set up a curatorium. There's probably 100 or more people, 10 or 20 communities across that vast expanse. So there I set up this thing I called a curatorium, which I guess is something like, um, you know, editorial boards or something like that. So together we, so it made it a longer, more complex project, given that they live in far-flung places and their grandchildren steal their phones and, you know, take their... <laughs> so the communication was slightly problematic at times. Um, so, but in this arrangement, of course, you've got to go to their office as well as them coming to your office. And when they come to our office, they can be reunited with some... We have... Yeah, my phone went off. Uh, the, the seven sister paintings that we have, but they have to, they've been dormant, so they have to breathe life back into them. So they dance, as soon as I see them, they start dancing and singing and bringing them back and reconnecting with them because they, as I said, they're not about country, they are country. Um, and the thing that, in order to, how, how I mean, there's no roadmap for this project, right? None. It may never have happened, or it could have gone for a hundred years, or you know, who knows? There's no, it's not like let's do an exhibition on blah and go around lots of places and collect works or commission them and put up a show. So a lot of the so the people on each of these three deserts don't actually know each other. They all have own or are custodians rather than owners, custodians of certain parts of the story. So they had to they had to decide where this convoy had to go and what they wanted to record about it for their next generation. Um, so we had this, these maps um, here, Google Maps, and then we went to various places and you can see um, which parts of the country. So there's Madhu country, and I think you'll see... They haven't got that back. Um, they... Um, so to denote the places, we, the paintings are portals to place. So when you go through this show, you are going exactly that kind of songline journey. Um, and then we mapped exactly that journey. So it's a journey exhibition uh, onto the gallery floor, basically. There's the three deserts. So there's Madhu, wherever it is. Madhu first, followed by Nanyachari there, and then the Pitanjari Ankhacha up here. And that was... the uh, so we just mapped it straight across and then you go, you'll see some song lines which you walk along and then you'll come to those places and learn as much as you can learn um, in this particular environment. Same here, see the other part of the country um, here? That's what that journey is. One of the other song lines are in there. And on country, of course, is when we did lots of the paintings and you'll see those jumpy sisters. Uh, in the flying, in the show, that's them being made out there. That's another, just showing you another part. And you'll record, some of you'll recognise some of these paintings as one of the song lines. I won't go deep into it, you'll get the gist. That's Kurala. Now, Kurala, that whole belly of gallery where you've got the flying sisters, and the very, this is that area, whole area is Kurala, those eyes of what he knew is in Kurala. So that's a whole area there that where a lot of stuff happened. Um, and therefore you can see, and then you can see here uh, under the paintings, the names of the places they are connected by a song line. So you are actually walking the song line if you can read the stuff and find out and there's little maps there so you can you can go and enjoy just as a lovely visual art display or you can go to the next level or the next level. There's a great audio. If you go to the NMA, National Museum of Australia website, um, there's a fabulous audio 
that goes with the show, for, what, for whatever reason, it's not available at this point. Um, and you should listen to it. The Seven Sisters will take you on the journey. I had Aboriginal actresses and they're flying and they're landing roughly and they're having a cursing a bit and running away from the fellow. It's really fun and it gives you the spirit of the journey. Again, you can see there. Um, and this is another one. I'm just showing you that this is another feature, which is that's what in Uru, in the other western part of Australia, unlike the, the middle where you saw him before, but this is him with his top knot. And again, um, this is the most graphic one that's, that non-Indigenous people in that area can see. And as I said, it went on this, this convoy, just to sh give you a little bit of the complexity, this convoy was in Māru country, which is Western Australia, up West Australia. There were 10 vehicles, I think 30 people of advanced years with lots of medication and stuff to take with us. Uh, we travelled 600 kilometres, mostly no roads, and um, I think 10 days, something like that. And we'd get to a certain place, because we were, they were taking us to places, to get to a certain place and let's say, oh, here, yeah, this one, this is an important story, you've got to do this one. And then, so, then the curator said, okay, what do we do? Oh, no, can't, we can't do this one. That Daisy, she didn't get on the, she didn't get on. She got off, so we can't talk about this, that's her country. Then we go to another one and nearby we say, what about blah? And they say, yeah, let's go there. And then, oh, no, Bill, no, nah, he didn't come. He got off too. So then you'd go on like for day after. So the journey was mostly packing and unpacking at Toyota. <laughs> but not to, but it was still, you know, um, what do you call relationship building and they did that big round painting with the boulders you'll see in the show. So stuff was done, but not what was planned. And you know, a trip like this can cost you nearly a hundred thousand dollars. So everyone's got to bring their rallies and their kids and their grannies and their, you know, so you end up and everyone has to be paid. It's quite a different curatorial journey than most. Uh -huh. And here's the seven, these are the ladies who are doing uh, Seven Sisters performance. I put this in, it was a performance at the museum, but I put this in to, to tell you that it is the performance which is the primary mode of the transmission of culture. So even though we had a stage direct, no one can interfere with this. The painting is a bit of a Western invention, right? The portable paint. The stories are theirs, but whether it's in green or blue or big or small, they, they don't mind. But this, no interference. And there's, there's the Wadi Nuru down there, forever lurking. And this is on the trip, of course, we did it, these rehearsals on riverbeds. I don't have time to tell you all the stories, but over the years of doing these performances on country, more and more of the ancient verses surfaced. And so by the end, I think they knew about three or four at the beginning, and they knew about 30 at the end, and I think there's about 40. There's that kind of ratio. And that's um, what Inuru personified at the opening of the exhibition in Canberra, and is very scary. And um, those people you saw just there on the blade, they appear throughout the exhibition. This is to, you know, to sort of like make you feel included, make you invited, like in Aboriginal protocols, you have to be invited into someone else's country, right? So this is inviting you in so you get away from that feeling like a voyeur of somebody else's culture. You know, so you absolutely feel included. And then in Australia, at least, and it's clearly it's a universal story in many elements, but in Australia, at least, um, it made Australians feel responsible for the story that they were now being bequeathed in a way. And the story is that with the, it was basically, we're here to teach you your story because if you, only, if you want to live in this continent and you could extrapolate to the world, and you only know your stories of 200 years ago, in Australia's case, or 250 years ago, then you'll never belong, you'll never take root, you'll only ever be a transplant. So everyone started feeling this total connection, whereas before they, you know, it was great people, lovely art, but what's that got to do with me? 
So this made an enormous difference to people feeling like it did have a lot to do with them. So they'd pop up at the various places, as you'll see over here. And the, um, of course, the whole thing was about um, passing it on to the young people. And they, they were proactive and strategic and not sort of, oh, my God, it's all over. They, as I said, they met them in the digital domain. They got all the stuff we collected, you know, uh, tapes, videos, oral stuff, and it's going to an Aboriginal managed archive. And this is sort of the public face of it, you know, the most exhibitable kind of stuff. So um, even here you see um, old men teaching young boys from, from his own place. And then um, here's one old fella from the west teaching the fella from the middle, the hat on, who's the custodian of that cave hill, the dome, teaching him about what happened to the seven sisters when it crossed the border and went into his country. It's like a TV series, you know. No one knew what came before, what happened after, so they all got together and said, <laughs> you know, shared notes. And the young ones, like this fella, um, as he says, you know, we, we pick up things real quick and, and um, if a young fella wants to do make a film like Curtis did um, on this story, then they have to go back to country. They need to learn who the right people are and you know, regard some regard to all the protocols. My name is Stanley Douglas. <laughs> Sorry, Stan, we've got to move on. Now, you'll see that, you'll see that um, in the, outside the dome. It's, I don't know where exactly it is, but it is there. And basically, we're saying that this dome is, um, is in fact Cave Hill. It is that site. So therefore, you must get permission from the owner first before being invited in. Now you'll see this in the dome, so I need to um, repeat it. Uh, but these are the people in, you know, looking at the cave, the rock art, and as I said, it's the only rock art site that we know of that exists on this, on the Seven Sisters story. And this whole doing all this high class filming meant it will we'll have it registered on the world, what do you call it, heritage listings. Um, and this, it's the dome that makes culture cool. So all the young fellas think it's cool now and they, you know, they were performed at the opening and they had to learn the Seven Sisters dance, the men and the you know, children, school teenagers. Then they see this and they see huge opportunities for them talking about their country and their father's country in this way and do it in, in you know, high tech. You, you guys are seeing this over there, so I'm not going to dwell. And you'll also know we've animated a number of the paintings, so you're going to see the story retold and retold with lots of variations, which is, in fact, exactly how it is in real life. You get stories retold many ways in different forms. Kunia, a carpet python. Good tucker. The sisters are hungry. The snake disappears underground. The sisters start digging to capture the snake. Come here, come here. Have a look. Our cooker, our meat, went inside the hole. Come on, we dig out the cooker. What he knew watches them digging. The sisters catch the snake, but there is something odd about it. They throw it up into the sky. So the interesting thing is, um, before I talked about it, we talk about country as, you know, country on the land, sky country, water country, sea country. It's all country. It's all part of the world view of country. So every night when the, you know, Pleiades and Orion appear, of course, it, it renews the story on the, on the ground. 
So if you know the story, it's always alive. And of course, it's it's a seasonal calendar. It's, you know, it's certain September, you'll see seven sisters more prominent and later in the year that you see 30 and then later in the year you see less. And that's when, you know, the fish are running or the, you know, that's all part of the integrated into um, the pragmatics of life as well. Um, this, oh, this one here, so we had it, ours, uh, a VR, I only put in because we found the Prime Minister and his wife lurking in there. <laughs> and of course, he saw me, so he had to do a selfie, didn't he? <laughs> you remember Turnbull from before? Now, this one here, uh, Hunting Ground, is particularly interesting um, because it's, ecolo it's, it's an encyclopaedia. It's up in the top corner, you'll see the Seven Sisters. See up here somewhere? Uh, seven little circles. There. Uh, and then you've got, it's like skin of country, you know, uh, lifted off and put on the floor to paint and it comes with the sinews of country beneath it. And you'll see in the show, you'll see the women sitting on it, painting, dogs walking across it, having a little nap because it becomes country. Um, and even though we know Aboriginal art's all done on the, on the ground, I think to see that actual time lapse of it being done, you actually get the sense of it. For them, they're just on country, sleeping, eating, dogs running around. And it shows, and again, I won't sort of have time here, but you'll see it there, but it shows, you know, cool fire burns, hot fire burns, when you should and shouldn't burn, when the water is up in the top part and the witchy grubs are fat. And in fact, it was done by eight women, older women, to teach the rangers about that country to how to care for it and so on. So it's a great little exercise in, you know, environmental non-degradation. And are oh, the other oh, there? You see in the catalogue, which I hear you're probably out of now, but and the show, this will show you some of the many details of this particular encyclopedia, painted encyclopedia. It's the third archive, as I said. Um, and the oh, we've got one minute for one quick story. When the women went with a white fella to this place once, and there was fire everywhere, and it was intentionally lit, and then these aren't wildfires, these are control fires, the white fella was just devastated because all this beautiful stuff's been burnt and the women and everyone was salivating, saying, oh, my God, all that takeaway, cook Goannas, cook snake, cook, <laughs> cook Richard E. Grubbs are all... Because it was a cool fire, it wasn't a hot fire, it didn't incinerate everything, so they thought that was uh, <laughs> pretty good uh, takeaway. So you can see in this one, it is um, in the middle, it's a time lapse, it took 10 days, eight women, 10 days in 45-degree heat in the tin shed. And um, you can see them moving in the actual, um, in the show. And the, side, the lady who did this filmic thing is Lynette Walworth, and she got an Emmy for this and that other VR that everyone was listening to. Um, so it's quite a beautiful contemporary piece. I love the fact you see it fusing traditional knowledge with contemporary presentation. Um, I won't show it here because you can see it in the show. That's it up close, sir. And this is seen as a fabulous, brilliant, high art form. So has many lives, Aboriginal art can exist in many places at the same time. Now, even though it's called the Seven Sisters, in the Aboriginal world, it's a gendered world and... There's always a male component, even though it might be predominantly said by women. So I've acknowledged the male component. Red for, you know, passion, fear, excitement, danger, and, you know, the maleness, spears, the snakes. And then there's this more women's room. I'm nearly finished now, so... Um, What's really interesting about this is those seven pots for seven women with the lustful pursuer lurking in the corner always is that um, Alison Millica Carroll asked her daughter to go out and get some munka munka leaves and the daughter went, duh. So um, 
she said, oh my goodness, this mob, they don't know. So they, the women got together and decided to teach them about you know, animals and plants because if you don't know, you don't know, in the, in the language word, it tells you whether you can eat them, how you have to prepare them, what season they're available, is it an eating plant, a healing plant? And so they thought, well, how are we going to do this? And they said, oh, who knows the story of country better than anyone else? Who has intimate knowledge as they travel the whole country? The Seven Sisters. So they taught them through the Seven Sisters. So each of these pots, for example, um, that's the water and I, can't, I think that's the honey ant. I can't see it properly from here. Um, there's widgety grub and all of the... All of the all of the shape shifting, all the things he's uh, wanting you to change into in order to lure the women are there. So the story was told. And here we are at the um, Art Centre Hub, which you've got here, which there is where all the arts are done in these Art Centre Hubs right across the desert where they drop in, things are sorted out, money's exchanged, things are made, knowledge is passed on. And, of course, we had to finish with the... Um, the jumpy figures, this is a, just a quickie, this is a dynamic, um, shows you how dynamic the culture is. It was Wadi Nuru who can change into a tree to trick the women to lure him to, to him, but when in recent times the women want to do a workshop on the Seven Sisters and they want to do the trees and the older women said, no, no, you can't, that's a man part, you know, that's Wadi's story, we'll get into trouble. After three days, the younger women won and said, well, what do, what do we have these stories for if we're not supposed to learn from them? That's what they're there for. So if he can change into trees, so can we, to hide from him. So off you go. There you go. And it's beautifully installed here, as you know. And there he is lurking again, right on the right side. And this is what, you know, some people say, this is what was said in Australia, but I have to get a new slide because what's said here is, well... It's a PowerPoint on its own. And here you go. Thank you. <laughs> I was saying how Songlines is um, um, a story of you know sixty five thousand years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's old, yes. And I'm always interested in how uh, it talks to the present, how it talks to our contemporary world, even how it talks mm -hmm. to our, our present environmental crisis and. Mm -hmm. I always think about um, a memory I keep with me is one of uh, Jacob Nyingul and uh, a traditional owner in Western Arnhem Land in Northern Australia, how he talks about his many responsibilities and he explains how these many responsibilities goes way back when he was still in his mom's womb. So reflecting on this responsibility to land as a custodian of land. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, Margot, yeah. how your experience of land mm. has changed over the years since you were a kid mm. and um, yeah, how it has developed. And as you say, you, know, you were not raised in Arnhem mm. Land or in the bush, so, mm. but it's still a story. Connected to country, though. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I meant to say at the beginning, when we usually introduce ourselves, we usually say where we're from, where our country is or our affiliations are. And in my case... I'm from what's called the Kulin Nation, which is, um, and have more than one affiliation, the Kulin Nation, which is in Victoria. Um, do you know Victoria? Of course you do. Uh, <laughs> at the bottom. And um, also the Gumbanga Nation, which is called the Northern Rivers, up perhaps towards Brisbane, if, if you know. So that's sort of saltwater country. I'm, known, I'm, I'm a saltwater person. However, I'm also a freshwater person. That is, my, my totem is a platypus, um, which is rife in, um, particularly in the Kulin Nation. And um, so I have an affinity with the platypus, which is very coincidental because the property I now live on just outside Canberra probably has the best platypus river in the in the, or in the country, if not the world. It's fresh water and there's lots of platypus. And really interestingly enough, I'm the only one who's seen them. So when I go, if you go you know, swimming around at um, dusk, I've had, you know, I've had one or two platypuses not run away from me. And you, know, you can only 
hope that's some sort of affinity. But also, you know, we had, you know, my grandmother used to take us out into the bush and t tell us about totems and stories and make sure we knew what they were because we did live in a world, world <clears throat> when I grew up in the 60s where you didn't, uh, if you didn't live in a reserve or on a mission <clears throat> or a designated Aboriginal place, then you didn't show off about being Aboriginal. You, you actually didn't tell other people because my mother, like other people in my family, were taken away. Um, so you never knew where the risk was. And 60s is, in fact, children were still being taken away till 70, 73. <clears throat> so it was a secret. And we sort of, I didn't think it was awful. I used to just think, you know, the seven, what's those, um, Phantom and all those other books, Enid Blyton's with people's secret identities was quite the thing, you know. So having a secret identity was made me different and special from the others. So I didn't know that that's called racism, of course, <coughs> till later. Um, <laughs> and I thought my nickname was Abbo. So, <laughs> um, so uh, in fact, I told people that was my nickname. So... You know, I lived in that sort of fluxus world, but I spent a lot of time, and, w and every year we do smoking ceremonies. You know, we, we, we do it differently than if you were living still in Arnhem Land, and we pick up, we teach each other some language or some language songs, and we do um, smoking ceremonies, sort of a blessing, cleansing ceremony. <clears throat> so we do that every New Year's Day. So we have this, and we call our kinship system like kitchen kinship, so we talk in almost surnames as kin names, you know, the Neils or the Smiths or the Bancrofts or the someone. And so it's a quite, it's a variation, but it's very much everybody, regardless of the background in Australia who are Aboriginal, will always claim an affiliation to country. That's your identity. That's who you are and how you accept it. So another question uh, about gender and this morning when I was walking again through the exhibition uh, it struck me again something I remembered when I first saw it in Canberra but here I felt I thought it was a bit more powerful um, how much the um, Seven Sisters story is one of self-empowerment a story of empowerment of women and, um, and of course this also talks to our contemporary world so we were talking together about it this morning. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it got you know, me thinking, you know, this, this is not only a story about women, uh, it's also told by women. And when we look at your curatorium oh, yeah. and uh, that uh, wonderful uh, ensemble of ladies who contributed to it, uh, it, it makes me think about the uh, crossovers uh, between uh, black and white culture. To, put it in, in broad terms. Uh, but we've, uh, anthropology as a discipline, for example, has gone through a long history where uh, initially all the field workers were men and they ended up working with Aboriginal men and uh, coming back with lots of interesting reports about ceremonies and so forth and uh, women's knowledge insofar as it existed was the uh, side order uh, on, the, on the main course. Uh, now, that really began to change when Aboriginal women started going out and doing field work, working with women and uh, finding that there's a whole parallel universe, basically. Got me thinking about you mm. as a female curator. Mm. And uh, in what way did, in fact, you being a woman affect the kind of story that you were being offered and that you got to curate and stage manage? Yeah, yeah I don't think there's any, what Martin was, intimating or saying, in fact, that, that people didn't believe that Aboriginal women had any ceremonial um, responsibilities or any ceremonies or anything of ritual significance because the only stories anyone ever knew was men's stories because it's a highly gendered society and the men, even cross-culturally, will only talk about their stories and not tell of women's stories and so on. So... <clears throat> um, and it, it, it's, it's right, it's even non-Aboriginal women, when they became anthropologists, of which there are few, really, isn't there? Relatives still few. 
And when they started going out in the, say, 70s and 80s and talking to Aboriginal women, there was this plethora of stories that, you know, I think the men rejected it because they didn't know about it and they would have known because the men would have told them without realising the men will not tell another a woman's story and nor will they tell another male story, right? So that's very... The lines are tight. And in my case, I think... Um, um, as a curator, there's no doubt my relationship with the bevy of women you saw there, we'd giggle and laugh and tease and, you know, be like women, but the men were very aloof and would always be aside and they, they step back for the women, but they were always there on the sidelines because as one of the fellas there, you see Mookie Taylor, uh, I can't, don't know how to describe him, except when he, when he laughed, his tummy jiggled. Do you remember that? <laughs> he tucked his shirt in just for the shot. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> and he's, he, was, he, he isn't a seven sisters person, but he had to be there. He said, that's not my dreaming, but I'm just here to make sure to, to support the women. I think he, he would have used well, protect the women or support the women. And it was quite interesting. So he took a, clearly a back role and he wouldn't speak about the seven sisters at all. Um, j just to show you, um, just a funny little, st just a little story about because that fellow's on the screen. Um, I, to I think I told, I told someone today, where, this is how, because um, someone had the audacity to say something to me the other night at a dinner party, but is this real? Now, here's a little story. <clears throat> we, were, we were camping at the bottom of that cliff, that escarpment with the rock face, with the Wadi Nuru, right? And everybody, we were there for three or four days and everybody speaks in really hushed tones because they don't want to get him stirred up, you know, might get a bit active. So they keep everyone. And then Josephine, the lady in that wheelchair with the snake coming towards her, was in the little tent next to me. <clears throat> and in the morning, five or six o'clock, was stoked to find, she says to me, hey, did he come to you last night? <laughs> I said, course. <laughs> I said, he said, she, what happened? I said, well, you know, didn't he come to you? No. <laughs> and we had this little banter going, you know what's real and what's not real? And then, and, and so she was running around telling on the camp that why didn't you come to my tent? And was this sort of the gossip of the camp? Was this, this, and you don't know, you know, you think it's joking, you're laughing, who knows? Anyway, 18 months later, <clears throat> They came to the museum because, you know, we go to their office, they come to our office, and here I am nursing a little brown baby, that one. <laughs> and Josephine just froze <laughs> and giggled and said, oh, look, man, a little one in you, a little one, <laughs> little one in you. And, you, and, and then, um, and it could, you know, <clears throat> so she, you still don't know, does she think, and then I said, oh, I was a, oh, I was a, oh. I was a bit older, Karen. I had to give it to my daughter to have, you know. Um, <clears throat> and we just carry this story that's been going on and it'll probably end up in the, in the, um, you know, the song lines or the dreaming stories for the future. It'll be told, and actually this is how things happen. It'll be told and retold and retold and 100 years down the track, someone's going to hear about this story <laughs> when one in era was reproduced by a little boy lives in Canberra. And <laughs> 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 Um, I, you know, I'm going to sort of add to an, another story there, but um, not too much of a transformation. I want to talk to you about technology. Uh, yeah, technology. The word, the word comes up quite a few times in your talk. Reminded me of something, a uh, story uh, told to me by one of my great Indigenous teachers, uh, Uncle Roy Barker. And uh, he was in the terrible position on of not being, you know, he put in native title claims, he couldn't get his country back. It's a man from New South Wales. Yeah, yeah. So cool. but he visited and certain farmers <coughs> would let him uh, collect wood uh, from his country and he'd use it to make boomerangs. He had a fabulous workshop, lots of power tools and, uh, a, and, and he could really sort of churn them out too. And, and a guy came in to buy a boomerang one day, saw him at work and was really, very displeased about yeah. this <laughs> and uh, said, well, ancient. you know, that, that, they, they can't be authentic boomerangs. And, uh, and Roy just said, 
I didn't see you turn up in a horse and cart. Uh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's an example of the way white people have wanted to uh, freeze de to deny mm. that indigenous people can be contemporary, that they are contemporary, mm. in fact. And uh, so I just wanted to sort of touch on that sort of mm. tension mm. in terms of technology and, and take up the point you're making mm. uh, that uh, virtual reality, yeah. the digital technologies uh, are, are actually fully in there in terms of keeping culture alive. Mm. Uh, and, and, and can you expand on that at all? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an expander. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I did, there's three points that's going to, oh, God, after that great claim, <laughs> I actually had a good, but it, it is true, the, the, the Aboriginal people in Arnhem Land and in the centre, they took to technology when I was up there in the 70s and computers were coming in, they were, they, they're the first to it, they have, they're just absolutely amazing because they have none of this if it works, if it's relevant, if it's going to do what you've got to do and to an end, as is the elders did with joining the other youngers in the digital domain, then, you know, then it's, there's no, um, I don't know, they seem, you know how, I don't want to say they're like children, but you know how children don't even think about, it. they just grab and do and make and they don't have that fear, I might get it wrong. I just find Aboriginal people, other than people like me, um, are really good at it. But the story I was going to say was, you know, this idea that Aboriginal people only exist in the minds of white people as long as they only satisfy a certain set of criteria. Are they, are they real Aboriginal, right? Dark skin, speak language, play didgeridoo, you know, all of that. Um, live in the top end or the desert. So even all these desert dwellers up here, I mean, they live in houses and drive Toyotas and have satellite TV and, you know, apps and, you know, it's just, and shop at the supermarket. It doesn't mean they can't go bush in their Toyotas and go hunting and singing and ceremony. You know, they do both, do everything. Um, <clears throat> but it seems that <clears throat> it's all right for, for example, in the, I think it's the Renaissance, um, you know, people, the artists would paint on wood uh, using oxides and then they progressed to oil or acrylic on canvas and that was called progress and that was an innovation that was called advancement but when Aboriginal people start moving off <coughs> traditional materials from oxides on bark that's traditional big tick have that Soon as they start moving on to the canvases, you now that's acceptable now, that you now see with acrylics and colour that's not earth colours and not made from the earth, it's a corruption of culture, it's contaminating, it is not real Aboriginal. Now that's taken a, two decades, probably nearly three, to get to this point. But you will still have people who say, I want to go and buy some Aboriginal art, and you show them one of those, no, nah, not that, that's white fella art. You know, so, so it wasn't progress or advance when our people, you know, innovated. And it's quite ironic because that's the reason we survived 60 to 65,000 years is because of the capacity to adapt to the times. As soon as glass hit our shores from Sydney, it travelled through the trade routes right through the country and became spearheads because it's sharper, it's lighter, it's, and yet, you know, it'd be seen as not traditional. So it's whatever is available, the ingenuity um, is there to exploit it, including the technologies, Great. as we saw. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Margaret. <clears throat> so a very quick one, last one, to have 10 minutes for, for oh, questions. Oh, okay, yes, yes. Oh, you want to ask questions too, don't you? Yeah, I want to maybe finish <clears throat> off with um, intercultural collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I've got here a book, uh, uh -huh. which is... Um, the first one of a series called First Knowledges that Margot, you're editing. Mm. So this first one is Song Lines, The Power and Promise. But it's interesting how, how all the books are intercultural collaborations. Yeah. And they're all, they were all written by an indigenous scholar and a non-indigenous scholar. And I yeah. find that really interesting. And you, you explain in the preface how 
and I'm quoting you, throughout the series you acknowledge the expertise of knowledge holders from both Aboriginal and Western disciplines. You talk about co-design, mm. co-authorship and intercultural work and you expand how authors are seniors in their respective fields and committed to Australia's shared history. Mm. So can you say just a few words before uh, we wrap up? Mm. Um, yes, I'm, I am committed to this idea of, you know, everyone talks about reconciliation and working together, but I find in most cases, it's not that, it's just get a little black off cider so you can tick the box and get the funding, or, or it's so sycophantic to the Indigenous person that it spoils them, um, and it's not an equal or mutual relationship at all. You know, too many are like that. So, you know, the first thing we have to do is what Songlines has done, or is doing, and will continue in Australia as it will here. Whether we like it or not, we're all legatees of whatever happened before, good or bad. So we have a shared past, therefore shared history, and we will have a shared future. So there's no point pretending that isn't the case, so you may as well make something of it. So uh, in this case, as you saw here, I, I recognise that I'm representing a white instit institution as a curator, that I'm not just going out there asking the mob for their stories and doing a lovely show and saying thank you in the panels, but that I had to acknowledge that it is their story, not my story or our story or our I mean, institution. But once it's told in our institution, it becomes our story. So I, I'm, sub, I'm a big subscriber to the um, shared history for a shared future idea. That's not to say you don't, you know, acknowledge past wrongs and things. But if you dwell in that space, you'll stay in that space. Well, um, all good things must come to an end, except song lines. Yes, it never ends. <laughs> they last forever. Yes. Uh, let's uh, invite Victoria to say a few last words. A big round of applause for Margot, Beatrice and Martin. Thank you.